Okay. Welcome to Black and Marine Science Week 3. I'm Leslie Townsell, the COO of Black and Marine Science. I'm currently a graduate student studying um, oysters and sharks along the Georgia coast and how climate change impacts them. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Angela Jones, who will be presenting on dynamic energy budgets and how they can work for your research. Angela Jones is a doctoral student in the Marine and Environmental Sciences at Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. Her interests are in functional micromorphology of invertebrates in the rocky intertidal. Her previous work focused on the intertidal ecosystems in Northern California, and overall her interest and experience is very across intertidal habitats to understand ecological relevance of organismal variation. In her doctorate, she hopes to continue rigorous science, but also connect with the community and synthesize information to make science more accessible, entertaining, and approachable for all. Um, Angela, I'll let you take it away. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Leslie, for that introduction. I'm gonna go ahead and try to share my screen. Okay. Uh, hold on one second. Okay, can you guys see that, the full screen? All right. Okay, so um, as Leslie said, my name is Angela Jones. I'm a second year graduate student, and I'm going to be talking to you guys about dynamic energy budget theory as kind of just a base um, introduction. And I'm gonna use my frame of research um, that I did throughout my master's and into my PhD to kind of set that, uh, set the tone, I suppose. So the way that I'm going to be doing that is um, introducing my research, specifically the work I've done with the sea star Pisasterocratius. Um, I'll talk about dynamic energy budget theory that has already been done on the species. And then we'll talk about other ways to use the model, um, the resources to use, and the conference um, that Deb is Dynamic Energy Budget is going to be having in 2023. So to go in theme with um, BIMS week three, which I'm so excited to be able to be a part of, I want to talk about how marine science is lit, right? How the sciences are lit. And um, using these photos, you can kind of see that anytime I'm out in the field, we try to have as much fun as possible. And sometimes that's in the mud flats covered in mud at 5 a.m. It's, you know, pulling stars off of docks or it's returning them back to the site, um, which you can see in this first photo. I've been interacting with the sea star Pisasterocratius since I was um, a sophomore in high school, volunteering at a zoo and aquarium that I'll talk about a little bit later. And I've been studying it in a like more formal capacity since I was a sophomore in college. Got my master's studying it and now I'm doing it my PhD as well. So I'm a big fan of this species. So Pisasterocratius is known as the ochre sea star. It is a Pacific species and it's known as a keystone predator. So what that means is that its biomass is ecologically, um, it contributes to the environment much greater than its biomass. So it lives in the rocky intertidal and it is a voracious predator on mussels, on turban snails and other things as well. And the amount that it eats is so great that it can actually shape the different zones of the intertidal. It is the classic example Bob Payne used in 1969 to describe the term keystone species. Um, and so it is one that is highly studied already. It also is really known for having high variation. So the colors can range, as you can see in this photo, from a pale, like a, like a vibrant orange to a beautiful like wine red or even a purple. Um, and they're in Alaska to Baja, California. I started formally studying Pisaster after a paper came out by Hayden and Palmer in 2013 that looked at body form um, based on the different environments. So they found that the shape of the star changes depending 
on how extreme the waves were. So if the star resided in a very calm environment, the body would be very tall and the arms would be wide and thicker. And in the reverse, in the very exposed environments, the stars would be very flat, which enabled them to hold onto the rocks and not get dislodged when the waves were going by. So it actually helped hold them a little bit more to the substrate. There is some um, negativity in being flatter, right? You lose um, energy stores in your arms and things like that because they're just smaller. Um, but they found when you return them, you switch them and you move the stars from a very protected environment into an exposed environment, they actually change their body to fit. So this is an, a great example of Pisaster being very plastic in response to environmental conditions. During this publication um, in 2013, they had a comment that said that the spines, the white dots that you can see on these stars, varied depending on the environment that they're in. So in the more exposed environment, it looked like they had more spines. And that is the comment that really changed the course of my career. So I'll talk about that further. So when I talk about the different environments that Pisaster resides in, um, these are some of the habitats from my work. So this is a bay in Northern California and you can see the water is very calm. The stars that reside there deal with less stressors in terms of, you know, super aggressive waves that could pull them off or damage the body. There's also um, bench sites, which are long expansive rocks that are covered in mussels and barnacles that are really great environment for Pisaster to eat on. But you can see in the edge that it's a wavier environment. The last environment that I look at is boulder fields. Um, I also looked at this in Northern California. So boulder fields are also long expensive rock, but it's made of more cobble um, instead. And the waves break up a little bit because of these boulders. Um, so just a different environment, but still kind of exposed coast. And this is a schematic of Pisaster just zoomed in a little bit. So you guys can see what I mean when I talk about the spines. Aboral just refers to the opposite side of the oral side. Um, so the stomach is on the bottom and the aboral side is the top side. Uh, those spines are the little white dots that are covering that you can see um, that I have boxed in red that I'm referring to. Most studies, when you think about spines in the ocean, are going to refer to um, like urchin spines or maybe even the crown of thorns sea star, Acanthaster, who has very long toxic spines. Few studies have really been done that look at these little small structures. Um, and after studying them for a while, I can understand why. So this is just to show you the variation that you see in terms of the spines in Pisaster. That you can see these are the same species um, and there's no subspecies found. The genetics are very widely mixed. Um, and you can see that the stars can either have very little spines or be completely covered. You can almost see no soft tissue on this surface. And so they were thought to be separate species in 1930, but that was rejected in 2008. So my project really gets at what is this variation? Is this significant to the environment? And what can we learn from this? So here are my sites. Um, one of my, my reference site is Point to Find Zoo and Aquarium. That's the aquarium I got my start in in high school. So I was able to go back to them and analyze the stars that have been living for years in their deep tank. That um, is a very calm environment. They're constantly giving food. So looking at stars that couldn't be happier, basically. And then I looked at boulder field habitats, um, two bay sites, and then two bench sites within Northern California. I also had to create methods to analyze the variation that we were hoping to see. And I used ImageJ to do that. And I isolated the central disk just because arms were always kind of variable. And um, using ImageJ, I was able to get a number of spines per the central disk area to get me a spine density result. 
And what I found was very interesting that the boulder field, the one where the waves can break up a little bit more, was the highest in spine density. As you can see on the y-axis, it's aboral spine density, number of spines per unit area, and then the habitats. The reference site, again, is the zoo and aquarium. And so that wasn't used in any calculations, um, just for like anecdotal comparison. So you can see the two pictures on the far right. The top picture um, is a star from the aquarium compared to one of the stars from the boulder field habitat. And you can see there's way more of these white spines visible in the bottom picture. What I was not expecting is that the bench environment had similar spine numbers as the calm bay environment. Based on the work from Hannon Palmer, you would think that the exposed sites, the, the benches, would have just as met many, or if not more, spines as the boulder field. So some other factors are at play, um, which led to more research. So I was also interested in the shape of the spines themselves. I used scanning electron microscopy, which is really cool. I was able to um, collect these spines similar to like a fingernail clipping, um, removing off the stars, which didn't cause any harm. And I put them in, um, I covered them in gold and then put them in a half a million dollar microscope called a quanta that basically shot electrons um, at the surface and gave me this micrograph, which is not truly an image, but gave me really good, good detail. Um, and so from there, I looked at different parts of the spine. So the spine head is that top part with those ridges, which are called spinelets. And then the base of the spine, the shaft, and then the bottom is the base. So I examined these um, on stars from all of these different environments. And I found these four different types, mainly. This very upright or columnar shape, the spade spine, which is also upright, but starts to come out a little bit more in the head. Blunt spines are just kind of squarish. And then you get these really cool convex spines where it's almost like a mushroom where the head extends outward, which I think is very interesting. And what I found is that the spine types were significantly different across the different environments, that the, um, the protected reference site had all spines that were mostly straight up and down. But when you compare the bench and boulder, which again had different amounts of spines, they had the same spine shape. Um, and then the bay had all, the mostly spade spine, like upright spines. So this is very interesting. You see that the environmental conditions that are happening, not what we expect, but the results are kind of different, opposing each other, which led to me getting environmental data. So I used um, a sediment trap and it's just a PVC elbow tube and an end cap. A lot of marine biology I think is great, especially in our tidal work because it's very inexpensive. So most of the stuff that I did, I just went to the hardware store. And so this, I was able to collect set sediment. Um, and then I just filtered out to keep all the coarse sediment to like remove um, large rocks or wood or anything that got kind of caught inside the trap. And then I also made these Claude cards, which are um, plaster of Paris that I also got at the hardware store. And that allows me to look at water motion. Now, you can't look at sediment and cloud card results separately because the amount of sediment in the water can also wear down the cloud card, not just the water. So you kind of have to look at these um, in a combination. And what I found was very interesting. So the top um, graph shows you the sediment, and you can see the boulder field has way more sediment than the other sites, that there were, we didn't find any sediment in the bench habitat and very little in the protected base, right? But when you look at the Claude card dissolution, the bench and boulder sites were not significantly different from each other. So what we can surmise from this basically is that the bench habitat potentially has more water motion 
while the boulder doesn't have extreme waves the same way, but because of the amount of sediment that's actually in the waves, it causes the same type of wear on the organisms. And so the results that I, that I just said um, led me to kind of being more interested in the variation, the variableness, the uh, variable aspects of the environment and how that affects the organism, right? Um, that the environmental conditions are not just singular. It's not just waves. It's not just sediment, not just temperature, but really the combination of these factors that um, can really all combine to affect the organism, organismal survival. So just to restate those, the stressors that I was interested in is the environmental conditions of wave intensity, the abrasion stress that we were seeing, ocean acidification, but also nutrients, right? Nutrient richness. What do they, what are they eating? If they're eating just barnacles that aren't as rich as mussels, is there a difference, right? And are there energetic trade-offs based on that, right? Um, if you have less food as a juvenile, does it affect your spine production as an adult? But these aren't all of the environmental factors that the um, organisms can experience. One thing I didn't talk about is the life cycle of Pisaster cretaceous. So it has a planktonic uh, larval stage. They are broadcast spawners. So the egg and the sperm are dispersed into the water column. They fertilize. And then you get um, this larval stage that can vary significantly. This is just a rough estimate, but um, 60 to 260 days um, in the larval stage before they can crawl out as juveniles. From the juvenile stage, it roughly takes four to six years to reach maturity. And then um, it's kind of hard to categorize the age exactly when it comes to the adults, but some um, aquarium have observed 80 year old sea stars. So they could be much older as well, right? So the lifetime of this species is very tricky and um, for us to really examine them over time because some of them might outlive our own lifespans, right? So that led me to dynamic energy budget theory. Um, my experience with it, however, though, is very limited. Um, I have not actually worked with dynamic energy budget theory on my own, but I'm going to talk to you about the stuff that's published currently. And that is a 2014 paper by uh, Monaco et al., which looks at the dynamic energy budget specifically for Pisaster. And it is it provides a general framework used to uncover the different physiological mechanisms by multiple stressors and that their combination and how that impacts the performance of the organism. It's based on empirically derived estimates um, that were captured using real research. Um, and this particular paper specifically looked at temperature sensitivity and feeding functional responses and how starvation dynamics affect Pisaster. So the theory truly um, is designed to incorporate the full life cycle of an individual in a changing environment. Um, so it examines energy uptake and how the organism balances the energy using very explicit rules um, and kind of creates an archetypal representative of the species to be analyzed in the models. Um, and then there's some models in dynamic energy budget theory that can look at intraspecific variation and population dynamics further. This model helps standardize how we examine organismal en energetics with aging. You can look at it with toxin effects and the consequences for maintenance throughout one's life cycle. All living organisms are covered in a single quantitative framework, which enables us to use predictions that incorporate experimental results at various levels of organization. So having DEB as a resource, I think is, is a very wonderful option for um, early you know, career scientists. So understanding DEB, I think is a little complex, but components of it is how energy is processed, in an organism, 
right? So the first step is food. What is consumed? And a portion of that, of course, is going to go to waste. But what happens to the rest of it in the body, right? There's going to be some energy that goes to reserves, energy storage, you know, fat storage, adipose tissue. There's going to be some that goes through growth of somatic tissue, general um, body growth, right? And the model generally assumes a very allometric or like streamlined proportional growth but you can add different portions um, into the model if there are succinct differences of puberty or something like that. It also factors in development and reproduction. Some energy is going to go to um, sperm and eggs and that kind of production. What gets complicated is the amount of parameters that are needed to examine um, your organism in dynamic energy budget theory. So I'm not gonna read all of these, but I think it's just good so you can see the number of pri primary parameters that are needed, um, which incorporates um, fixed variables that are needed. So if you were looking at a plant, you'd want like a photosynthetic rate. Um, estimations from research, right? So using um, previous studies to get more information um, into your model then you can collect more data. So for this particular project, they needed to know more about um, feeding rates in different temperatures. And so they collected their own data fairly easily in the lab and incorporated it into the model. And then there's some, to, some parameters that are just part of the DEB theory in general that you can get from DEB tools. And so we're gonna talk about those resources a little bit more. There's also auxiliary parameters that are um, like the temperature dependent parameters, or if you were looking at toxins or ocean acidification that you would specifically add to the model as well. It, when it came to pie zuster, they had to put in parameters of growth from the larval stage, from the juvenile stage and the adult stage, each of these to understand truly how energy reserves change um, in each of these life cycles. And so what this Monaco paper found was that um, they used DEB to analyze variations in the thermal tolerance of Pisaster, incorporating the many aspects of growth and consequences of the environmental conditions. And they found that it was pretty accurate in tracking the growth at each of the, the life stages, but it dropped when predicting changes in biomass. And that can happen um, due to like not, not truly understanding when the spawning events are occurring. Um, spawning can happen um, well, just within a season. So it gets kind of difficult to predict exactly when that's gonna happen within the model. And when spawning occurs and they're releasing their eggs or their sperm into the water column, there's going to be a change in biomass. The other thing that was very interesting is that the energy reserves um, they found did not contribute greatly to the biomass and part of that is because Pisaster's structure can be broken down when food is limited. Urchins also do this, um, but a good example is Pisaster can go up to 18 months without food. And so in the likelihood of like being without food, they break down their skeletal components and things like that um, and reabsorb it in a way of using it for energy. So this model found that um, the reserves weren't the best for biomass because Pisaster can do this, which just is really shows the testament to what they were doing because the model had so much information to it. So again, um, just I've talked about some of these, but the benefits of using DEB models is that you, you can predict organismal like variation, right? In the wake of, you know, climate change and wasting disease and um, a lot of these other stressors, you know, in oil spill events, you can use um, a dynamic energy budget model to predict um, what could happen to species. I think this is a great resource because it's something that you can use um, in a way to further your research without being on the water, right? Um, and it's also a combination of relatively simple experiments. Again, the drawback is the math portion of the study. Um, but 
the dynamic energy budget community has so many resources that are available and um, BIMS is working a bit with Deb to increase that. Because unfortunately, this field is relatively small. There are less than a thousand publications. Um, it is international, though mostly European scientists participate in this area of study. There are many, many um, organisms already examined when it comes to dynamic energy budgets and those resources you can find online. So there's an event, um, a series of events in 2023 that would be great for BIMS um, participation. So they have their eighth international symposium um, for dynamic energy budget theory for metal metabolic organization. It's going to be in Louisiana this year. Normally it happens in Europe. So this is a really cool, this is the first time it's happening in America. For people that can't go to the in-person event, there is a five week international telecourse. That's gonna be from March 23rd to May 4th. And it's online, it's going over the theoretical components of DEB. It's going to have um, live teachers there to help um, answer questions or to troubleshoot issues. And then there's also a in-person eight day training that happens um, in line with the in-person symposium, June 5th through June 13th at Louisiana State University. And then there's a three-day symposium where there's keynote speakers and people are presenting the research they're actually doing um, in this field. So the resources are amazing. I'm gonna actually put it in the chat um, as soon as this is over, but um, Deb Tools, the link Deb Portal, is great. You can register to their Deb library, which has all of the publications, including books, even a poem that have been used in this field. And there's all of the resources for a lot of the modeling, a lot of the math, there's tutorials. So this is really helpful resource for anyone that's interested in adding dynamic energy budget theory. And you can do this for any organism. You can do it for a sub organismal level. Um, it includes um, plants, animals, um, you know, not just invertebrates or pisaster like I've talked about today. So with that, I'm a little um, pressed for time. So I'm just going to transition to questions. Thank you guys so much for allowing me to participate. Okay, here is, if I can paste it. Okay, so let me just go ahead and post this in here. It doesn't look like there are any questions. Okay, this is the Deb portal that you can access any information on dynamic energy budget theory. And then I'll send it back to Leslie. Thank you so much, Angela, for that wonderful presentation. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I don't see any questions in the YouTube chat. Um, so Angela, can you tell them once again how they can get in contact with you? Yes, it is jones.ang at northeastern.edu. Wonderful, thank you, thank you. Um, so with that, uh, make sure to follow, uh, make sure if you have any questions after the fact, please reach out to Angela. Uh, make sure to follow Black and Green Science for more events this week. Up next, we have um, Dive into Marine Science uh, with our colleagues from the Gambia tomorrow, December 1st. Oh my goodness, I can't believe it's already December. Um, and that's going to be at 1.15 Eastern. So make sure you hop onto BIMS TV and set a reminder for yourself to tune in. You don't want to miss it. Thank you all.